Under the cover of darkness, a lone sniper arrives at the concealed perch. He unpacks his rifle with practiced efficiency, assembling it piece by piece in an almost ritualistic fashion. Settling into the shadows, his piercing gaze narrows to a singular focus, the unsuspecting target. With time seemingly suspended, the sniper pulls the trigger with unwavering concentration, making a headshot with chilling accuracy. The target crumbles to the ground. Just as swiftly as the shot was taken, the sniper disassembles the rifle and retreats into the night, with the area remaining oblivious to the silent dance of death that unfolded in its midst. Sounds cinematic, doesn't it? That's because it is. Scenes like this only exist in the realm of fiction, often crafted by the imaginative hands of Hollywood directors. But the truth is that this relatively short scene is riddled with factual errors. In real life, snipers are rarely alone. They can easily spend 24 to 72 hours stalking their target, they aren't ready to shoot immediately, and as the title of the video suggests, they rarely take the headshot. Now, the other three inaccuracies probably make more sense. In contrast, avoiding a headshot often surprises people. After all, isn't a sniper's job to neutralize the target with a single, precise shot? And what better part of the target for this goal than the head? Well, in reality, there are better parts of the body to target. And neutralizing the target often isn't even the sniper's primary task. Since snipers are obviously misunderstood in more ways than one, let's dispel these myths and shed light on the realities of sniper operations. To do this, we must break down everything that goes into what the US Department of Defense calls the art of the shot. Let's start with the sniper's mindset. What do snipers think about before pulling the trigger? There isn't a single answer to this question. Instead, there are dozens of possible considerations going into a single shot, and the sniper usually makes a sort of mental checklist encompassing all of them. But what are these considerations? Number one is undoubtedly ballistics, the bullet. Snipers must account for anything that might affect the bullet's flight path and cause them to miss. This extensive knowledge of ballistics is actually what separates snipers, who make up less than 0.5% of the United States Army, from the rest of the troops who simply have a good aim. When discussing bullet ballistics, it's crucial to pay attention to both internal and external factors. Internal ballistics refers to everything happening to the bullet while it's inside the rifle. A US Army sniper instructor puts it, the bullet is not going to lie to you. For instance, internal factors include the barrel twist, which affects the bullet's stability at greater distances. However, internal ballistics also includes the bullet's size and weight, as these factors can determine how much the bullet will be impacted by external factors. Speaking of these factors, they are part of external ballistics. External ballistics cover everything that affects the bullet's path after exiting the barrel. These factors include wind, humidity, temperature, air density, barometric pressure, out of all of these factors, wind is arguably the most influential. Why? Because it can change speed and direction suddenly and inexplicably. With this in mind, it shouldn't be surprising that the wind accounts for most missed shots in the US Army. That's why snipers pay special attention to this factor. During wind readings, they rely on the on-the-fly wind indicators like trash, flagging vegetation, clothes on a clothesline, smoke drift, dust, or virtually any lightweight object that responds to wind movement. Snipers gauge how these elements interact with the wind to determine its speed and direction at various points along the bullet's flight path. Now, the next sniper consideration might surprise you. When preparing for a shot, snipers must account for the curvature and rotation of the Earth. That's right, these factors play a role, especially in long-range shots. This has to do with the Coriolis effect. The Coriolis effect is the apparent deflection of moving objects, such as air or water currents, caused by the Earth's rotation. This deflection occurs to the right in the northern hemisphere and the left in the southern hemisphere, influencing global wind patterns, ocean currents, and evidently, bullet trajectories. A deflection of even a few inches can cause snipers to miss. That's why they must keep the Coriolis effect in mind. If they're shooting west, the bullet will drift slightly to the south, hitting lower than expected. When shooting east, it's the opposite. The target will drop down ever so slightly, causing the bullet to hit higher than expected. Other considerations snipers should keep in mind before pulling the trigger include the shot's angle, the target's elevation, and anything else that could throw off the shot, such as thicker vegetation, sun glare, and obstacles in the bullet's path. Since the sniper's first shot is likely their best chance at striking the target, they will only fire when most of these factors align for optimal accuracy. When this happens, they usually only say two words, shooter ready. So we've covered what calculations the sniper must make before pulling the trigger. 
Next, how do snipers remain hidden when stalking their targets? The answer is, again, two words, this time, ghillie suits. A ghillie suit is arguably the sniper's most significant asset on the ground, as it allows them to stay concealed in various terrains by mimicking surrounding vegetation. This means a ghillie suit consists of branches, leaves, moss, and any other local vegetation that will help them match their surroundings. For instance, a sniper will likely use dead grass when stationed in an arid environment. But blending in isn't the only goal of a ghillie suit. This suit must also break up the curves of the human body that might otherwise catch the eye. These curves include the side of the neck connecting to the shoulders, armpits, the groin. Breaking up these curves is no easy task. That's why an entire day at the elite US Army Sniper Course, USASC, is dedicated to learning to make a ghillie suit. Snipers-to-be are instructed to use a durable fabric for the suit's foundation, most commonly burlap. Reinforce the high wear and tear areas by sewing or gluing them down and meticulously attach the vegetation. Soldiers are also taught how to camouflage the body parts the suit doesn't cover, like the face, neck, and hands. With the full camouflage ensemble on, students go through the event known as the ghillie wash. This event has two goals, to test the suit's durability and to ingrain natural colors into the suit's fabric. With the ghillie suit out of the way, there's only one essential piece of equipment left, the sniper rifle. Now, singling out just one sniper rifle is a complex task. After all, the US heavily invests in its military, spending about $877 billion in 2022, which was 3.5% of its gross domestic product, GDP. That's why it shouldn't be surprising that the US Army uses over 50 different sniper rifles. This staggering figure can also be explained by the many scenarios snipers might face. The type of rifle used will likely depend on whether the sniper is in a crowded city or nature, a searing desert, or a snow-covered mountain. The mission might include simply patrolling or engaging in overwatch for the assault team. Or the sniper might deal with a hostage situation or a counter-sniper operation. Whatever the case, there's no use in trying to list all the rifles a US sniper might use. Instead, we'll focus on one beloved by many snipers, the M2010 Enhanced Sniper Rifle. We'll use this model to explain how snipers assemble their weapons leading up to the shot. Immediately after this explanation, you'll find out why the shot in question is rarely a headshot. But for now, let's go back to the M2010. This bolt-action, magazine-fed weapon system is chambered for the .300 Winchester Magnum ammunition and has a five-round capacity. With the suppressor, this rifle is roughly 52.2 inches long while weighing 18.7 pounds when loaded. As for the effective firing range, the M2010 can engage targets at distances of up to 1,312 yards. The M2010 was first built for the Special Forces fighting in the war in Afghanistan in early 2011. Since then, it's become a favorite due to its ability to fold down to a more compact size for transport, as well as be tailored to accommodate a wide range of shooter preferences. In total, 2,558 M2010 rifles have been manufactured. Interestingly, the total number of US Army snipers is also around that number, roughly 2,000. Sounds like a match made in heaven. But to make this match possible, let's see a brief overview of the most important steps in the M2010 assembly. Step 1. The sniper attaches the barrel to the receiver and secures it tightly. The M2010 uses a 24-inch hammer-forged carbon steel barrel that contains a twist spiral grooves designed to give the bullet a spinning motion, thus improving its accuracy. Step 2. The sniper inserts a rotating bolt, ensuring it functions properly. Step 3. The sniper affixes the optic system, in this case a Leupold Mark IV 6.5 to 20 by 50 mm tactical rifle scope with a scalable range. This scope has several purposes and benefits. It enhances precision in limited visibility, provides a waterproof picture, and reduces light diffusion. Step 4. The sniper mounts the bipod to stabilize the rifle. Though bipods are primarily used in the prone position, snipers also rely on them for additional support when alternating shooting positions. Step 5. The sniper mounts the suppressor. This non-lethal firearm accessory will lower the shot's sound to around 130 decibels at most, which is roughly as loud as a chainsaw. The suppressor will also eliminate the muzzle flash. Step 6. The sniper verifies the functionality of all components through a thorough inspection. If all is well, there's nothing left to do but to take the shot. But which body part will this shot target? We've established that it isn't the head, but why? Snipers don't usually go for the headshot because heads are actually quite challenging targets. 
they are relatively small and they move around almost constantly. This makes them almost impossible to hit, especially from longer distances. So where will the sniper target? When shooting from significant distances, like over 300 yards, snipers will aim for a bigger surface, increasing their chances of a successful hit. The surface in question is the center mass, or the upper portion of the chest. Think of this surface as a triangle stretching from the chest to the neck. Alternatively, snipers can aim for another triangle, the one from the hip bones to the pelvis. These two areas contain the neck, the heart, the lungs, and the gastrointestinal tract, all potentially fatal targets if hit. However, this choice will depend on the sniper's distance and mission circumstances. Since snipers typically only get one chance to put the target down, they'll have to decide where to aim on the fly to ensure a higher kill probability. In some situations, snipers can also aim to wound and not kill. Why? Because the wounded target will typically be hauled to safety by at least two teammates, taking a more significant number of enemies out of action. The only situation where snipers might be forced to go for a headshot is when the target is wearing sturdy body armor. Police snipers can also shoot at the head, especially if the target is hiding behind a cover. Since these snipers shoot from much shorter distances, they can target the head more accurately. Now that we've dispelled arguably the biggest myth about snipers, let's tackle the rest. First up, stalking and eliminating a target is all snipers do. In reality, stalking a target is just one aspect of a sniper's duties. Sure, it's a crucial aspect, but snipers don't get to do it as much as you would think. More often than not, probably in 90% of operations, snipers are involved in extensive reconnaissance tasks, gathering critical intelligence for the successful execution of missions. Just think about it. If snipers can get within shooting distance from their target, they can also discreetly observe its movements. The gathered information is then sent to the command to be used for crucial mission decision-making, such as organizing airstrikes. If the command proceeds with an airstrike, the sniper will also be there to report whether the target was hit effectively. However, there's another crucial sniper's duty that may or may not involve shooting. The duty in question is providing overwatch for tactical operations. During a tactical operation, snipers are assigned areas of responsibility with one goal, watching over their teammates and ensuring their safety. If, for example, one of the enemy combatants on the ground finds a way to endanger the team, the sniper, positioned strategically, can swiftly and accurately neutralize the target. Just knowing that there are vigilant guardians watching over them allows team members on the ground to move more freely and do their jobs with confidence. Experienced soldiers often say they can't even count how many times a sniper saved their lives during an operation. That's what makes snipers arguably the most valuable asset in a tactical team. However, it's essential to know that snipers also work in teams. At a minimum, they work in a team of two, a shooter and a spotter. Though you'll rarely see the latter in Hollywood blockbusters, their role is actually more important than the shooters. Think of the spotter as a team leader who's in control every step of the way. Spotters decide all the gear they'll need for the mission, communicate with the command team, identify the actual target, and give firing commands to the shooter. Basically, the shooter is only there to pull the trigger. If the shooter happens to miss, the spotter will make a swift second-shot correction and relay that info to the shooter, who will, hopefully, be more successful the second time round. It takes a lot of experience to become a spotter. These individuals have already served as shooters, mastering the art of the perfect shot, so now their job is to help others do the same. Let's tackle another misconception from the cinematic intro to the video. No, snipers aren't ready to shoot as soon as they get into position. First, they must go through the so-called direct fire engagement process. This process can be roughly broken into several steps. Step 1. Detecting potential threats or targets in the environment. Step 2. Identifying the target's identity. Step 3. Deciding whether to engage the target. Step 4. Engaging the target after considering relevant internal and external factors. Step 5. Assessing the immediate impact of the shot. Now, these steps might seem simple. One, two, three, and we're done. But in reality, days can pass between some of them. Being a sniper requires a huge amount of patience. The same goes for discipline and attentiveness, as the sniper will need lots of those to stay focused throughout the mission with all the waiting they must deal with. During this time, snipers often operate without the help of their unit, so they must also learn how to manage their resources effectively. All these necessary skills beg the question, can anyone or anything replace snipers? This brings us to the next myth about snipers. Technology is slowly phasing their role out. According to an instructor at the US Army Sniper course, this claim is absolutely false. 
Sure, things like drones, robots, and satellites can immensely aid snipers, enhancing their surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities. However, the unique combination of skills, adaptability, and decision-making that a human sniper possesses makes them irreplaceable. And that's not to mention that technology can be rather unreliable in specific circumstances, such as adverse weather conditions or electronic interference. That's why snipers are taught never to rely on electronics entirely, even though there are tools that can help them determine crucial factors like range, wind speed, and environmental conditions. The tool used to calculate the range or distance is called a rangefinder. This device sends a laser pulse toward the target and measures how long it takes for the pulse to be reflected off the target and returned to the sniper. Military-grade rangefinders can operate at ranges of up to 25 miles and are often combined with monoculars or binoculars. Still, snipers will often use these and similar electronic devices only to verify the data, but ultimately they will rely on their training and skills to make critical decisions. Speaking of these skills, they do translate to the civilian world, despite another popular misconception. That's why civilian and government agencies often recruit snipers after they leave the military. Thanks to their unique set of attributes, they will excel in any role requiring keen observation, decision-making under pressure, and situational awareness. Okay, so we've covered most of the major myths regarding snipers. Now let's do a rapid-fire round to dispel some of the sillier ones. Number 1. Snipers don't take diazepam to reduce trembling. This medicine might be prevalent in sniping video games, but in reality, it could cause the sniper to feel sleepy, dizzy, and forgetful. Number 2. Snipers don't hold their breath when taking a shot. This would only starve their body of oxygen and make their aim less steady. Instead, snipers are trained to control their breathing, taking the shot during a natural respiratory pause. And number 3. Snipers don't close one eye when shooting. Despite what many movie scenes might suggest, shooting with one eye closed would only limit their peripheral vision and situational awareness. It would also cause unnecessary strain on the eye that remains open, affecting the sniper's focus and overall shooting performance. But let's say something does get in the way of a sniper's performance and they miss the shot. What happens then? It all depends on the specific circumstances and the target. If they act quickly enough, they might be able to adjust accordingly and take another shot, this is primarily made possible by the splash of the first shot or the exact location where the shot landed. Still, missing a shot can greatly compromise the overall mission, especially if it reveals the sniper's position. With this in mind, let's discuss another commonly asked question. What happens to captured snipers? The short answer is nothing good. Captured snipers are usually treated much worse than other prisoners of war due to the specialized nature of their training and the threat they pose to the enemy. These enemies see snipers as treasure troves of intel, which is why they often subject them to harsh interrogation methods that might deviate from established rules of war. With this in mind, it shouldn't be surprising that most snipers would rather die than be captured. However, the enemy troops certainly don't make avoiding capture easy. You see, they often heavily invest in sniper countermeasures aimed at capturing these highly skilled soldiers or eliminating them altogether. The most popular among these include using friendly snipers to engage the US snipers, employing unmanned aerial vehicles, aka drones, to detect potential sniper positions and movements, using electronic jamming equipment to disrupt communication and targeting systems used by snipers, dispatching canine units to track and locate them, creating a smoke screen to disrupt the sniper's line of sight, rushing the sniper's position to flush them out and eliminate them, bombarding the area where snipers are suspected to hide. Given all these measures, it's safe to conclude that snipers are seen as the deadliest soldiers on the battlefield. The combination of marksmanship, stealth, and ability to gather critical intelligence makes them a formidable and high-priority threat. But how do snipers become such lethal soldiers? The answer lies in the US Army Sniper Course. We've already mentioned this prestigious course when discussing the ghillie suits. Still, these suits are just a small fraction of the extensive training provided to snipers to be. This course takes place at Fort Moore, Georgia, and lasts for seven weeks. Only about 300 soldiers from the Army or National Guard will get the chance to complete this course yearly. At best, half of them will be successful, which speaks volumes about the rigorous nature of the course. Here's a brief overview of what the US Army Sniper Course entails. Week 1, soldiers are tested on their physical and marksmanship skills and taught to make the ghillie suit. Week 2, snipers-to-be go through stalking events, target detection, and reconnaissance exercises. Week 3, students learn the basics of sniper marksmanship and range estimation. Week 4, physical challenges become mental as limited visibility scenarios are introduced. 
Week 5, students start practicing with moving targets. Week 6, future snipers are taught to use new weapons and shoot them from less stable positions. Week 7, soldiers carry out full-fledged missions and get graded on their success. The graded stalking events are the reason most trainees don't make it through the US Army sniper course. During these events, they spend several hours moving at a snail's pace, trying to reach their target while avoiding detection by the course's instructors. The latter part is usually what goes wrong, as these instructors are experts in spotting even the slightest movements or disturbances in the environment. Of course, all of these exercises are meant to simulate real-world scenarios, preparing snipers for complexities they may face in actual combat situations. These complexities are also why snipers never stop training and learning, even after leaving Fort Moore. Battlefield tactics are constantly evolving, so snipers also refine and adapt their skills to stay ahead of potential threats and keep the title of the most feared soldier on the battlefield. And there you have it, all the most popular questions about snipers answered, including why they avoid headshots. Now it's time to hear from you. Have any of these facts surprised you? Sound off in the comment section below. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more military content from military experts.